This child killer has been caught after 31 years. Seven-year-old Nikki Allen was murdered in 1992. She disappeared while walking home from her granddad's house in Sunderland on the 7th of October. Heartbreakingly, she was found deceased in an abandoned building nearby. She'd been hit with a brick and stabbed. Convicted S offender David Boyd has now been arrested. He'd actually been in a relationship with Nikki's babysitter at the time. Now, some claim that the reason he got away with this for so long is that the police investigation was seriously flawed. David was convicted of assaulting a nine-year-old child in 1999 and exposing himself to young girls in 1997. These are insane videos you need to see before you die. The video I'm about to show you is a 109-year-old monk who is lying on his bed and playing with his grandchildren. But the crazy thing is this man is 109 years old and I don't know, something about how he looks is just unsettling. Here's the video. <laughs> so that's what a 109 year old man looks like. After seeing this video, would you like to live to 109 years old? Alabama man charged with allegedly killing his grandparents, his brother, and his family friend with a gun and a pickaxe. This happened in Daphne, Alabama, and this dude had a GTA loadout going in there. Jared Smith Bracey behind me will now be charged with four counts of capital murder, and he could face the death penalty if he is convicted. Police got reports of multiple gunshots happening in a neighborhood, so they pulled up with the SWAT team, and then they found Jared Smith Bracey hiding in the woods behind the house. Apparently, he was arrested earlier that day because he damaged a door at the home, so he was arrested for criminal mischief. He was bailed out, and then as soon as he got bailed out, that's when he came back home and started shooting everybody. He's now being held in the Baldwin County Jail with no bond. He pled not guilty and claimed he had a mental illness that was affecting his perception. An investigator said Smith Bracey has been very polite and cooperative with police. However, he has showed no remorse at all for killing his family members or his family friend. Also, this guy is only 22 years old. That is very young to be doing all of this. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. And as always, these videos are for informational purposes only. This is proof we aren't alone. Okay, so this TikTok account recently captured something extremely disturbing on the top of a mountain. It was in Mexico and it looks like a giant humanoid creature moving about on top of the mountain. This thing has to be over 10 feet tall and here's the video. So what do you think is going on here? Do you think this is a giant or some type of other humanoid creature? And we all remember what happened to the last person who recorded giants on a mountain. Yeah, you guessed it, they killed him. So I wonder what's gonna happen to this man and I'm actually super curious to what this actually is. This is Casey Sims behind me and he just fatally shot somebody who disrespected his grandmother. This happened in West Virginia. A judge has sentenced this 21 year old to life in prison after he fatally shot someone that disrespected his grandmother. Now this entire ordeal happened in 2022. They did charge him for first degree murder. Casey Sims will be eligible for parole after serving 17 and a half years. Officers responded to the scene about gunshots back in November of 2022. They found Ashton Owens dead on the floor with two gunshot wounds. They had no idea he was dead at the time, so they airlifted him to the hospital where he was pronounced dead eventually. Apparently this argument started on Facebook too. This is such a classic like Facebook boomer story. And of course this stuff only really happens in like the deep south. And it did not stop there. Even after being booked in the jail, this dude is still threatening everybody in the facility. He threatens his fellow inmates. He threatens the correctional officers. He threatens the staff in general. He just does not care. He's already had multiple violations of him disrespecting everyone and threatening people. I believe he also made a weapon while he was in there. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. And as always, these videos for informational purposes.
Have you ever seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Surprisingly, no, bro. I know the killer's Leatherface and stuff like that, but I just never seen the movies. All right, so Leatherface, right? He has a mask, right? But his mask is made of human flesh, right? Somebody's face. So basically, this story right here is a real life case. His name was. He really, really loved his mom. Like even though she was fucking psychotic, that's all he had, bro. You know what I'm saying? Cause he tried, he tried to socialize for the first time, but since he he had a speech impediment and he also had a a lazy eye, so people were like bullying him and shit, not trying to fuck with him, bro. So all he had was really his mom and his brother, right? A couple years passed, his mom died, and then in November 1957, Bernice Warden, right? She was a lady who owned a shop. She ended up going missing. So they're like, what the fuck is happening? Where the fuck is Bernice? They go to the shop, and the last person who was seen there was Ed. So the cop goes to his fucking house, bro. So and then that's video. when they just see the, probably one of the most disturbing things that I'm about to talk about right now. First of all, they see a fucking mess. Then they see Bernice from her ankles and shit. Obviously dead. They see a bunch of furniture and things made of human flesh. They see a lamp made of human faces. They see utensils made of human bones. His bed frame is decorated with human skulls. He also has a jacket made of human flesh. And then he made a suit with his mom's face. And he would wear it because he wanted to be close to his mom and shit. And the rest of the parts was just all from grave bodies. Let me see the pictures, bro. That's one, for example. What the f- Let me see. No way this is real, bro. That's like a mock-up, bro. It's not oh, it's a mock -up. Major accidentally admitted to killing people to the police while he was playing a video game. A gamer known as Elijah was having a normal day while he was playing on Rainbow Six Siege. The game is described as an online tactical shooter video game. Unfortunately for Elijah, he accidentally pocket dialed 911 while talking on his headset. As he told his friends, I just killed two people, the operator mistakenly thought he was admitting to a double homicide. He carried on playing, having no idea that the authorities were listening in. Within minutes, officers swarmed his house. Elijah had heard the dog barking, so he went outside to see what the noise was. He was met with an officer pointing a gun at him and was obviously completely shocked. He immediately started to try and explain, stating, I was playing the game and I butt dialed the phone, that was my bad. Reluctantly, Elijah had to call his mum, who had no idea what was going on and she was at work. He had to explain to her why there was loads of police outside the house questioning him. These are disturbing facts about your favorite TV shows, part one. Up first, actor Matthew Perry, who was on the hit show Friends, battled with such a severe addiction to alcohol and painkillers that he admitted he doesn't even remember filming seasons three, four, five, and six of the hit show Friends. And he also says you can tell what drug he was using by how he looked in the show. Next up, we all know the hit cartoon show Bob's Burgers. But do you know what the original pitch for the show was? The original idea was that the Belchers were murderous cannibals who served patties from human flesh. This is actually wild, and imagine Bob's Burgers went in this direction. Do you think it would still be loved, or do you think it would be hated? Next up, this is John Crickfalusi, who is the creator of the Ren and Stimpy show. He groomed and abused multiple underage girls during the five years of it being broadcasted on Nickelodeon. In 2018, two of his victims spoke out against him. And when approached by BuzzFeed, he admitted to having a 16-year-old girlfriend. This is just another example that the person you look up to can actually be one of the most sick human beings on the planet. This man murdered after being humiliated on a TV show. The Jenny Jones Show was a daytime talk show which first aired in 1991. In 1995, an episode was filmed which was called Revealing Same Sex Secret Crush. Straight man, 24-year-old Jonathan Schmitz, was invited onto the show. He was told he had a secret admirer and later on he admitted that he just went on the show out of curiosity. Little did anyone know, Jonathan had previously struggled with his mental health and the TV show was about to push him over the edge. During the episode, host Jenny Jones revealed that his secret crush was actually a man that he knew. It was one of his neighbours, a man called Scott. In front of the studio audience, Jenny encouraged Scott to describe in graphic detail what he wanted to do to Jonathan. This was extremely uncomfortable to watch. In response, Jonathan laughed awkwardly and stated that he was definitely heterosexual. According to testimony at the murder trial, three days after filming, Scott left a suggestive note at Jonathan's house. After finding this, Jonathan went to withdraw some money from the bank and purchased a shotgun. He then went to Scott's mobile home where he confronted him about the note and Scott simply smiled. Jonathan left, went to his car, grabbed his shotgun and went back inside. He then shot Scott twice in the chest, killing him. He immediately rang police and confessed what he'd done. 
Jonathan was found guilty of second degree murder and sentenced to 25 to 50 years in prison. This was then overturned on appeal, but then was reinstated. Jonathan was eventually released in 2017. These are insane videos you need to see before you die. The video I'm about to show you shows a skier hitting a rock and then falling down a 1,000 foot slope in Aspen, Colorado. This video is absolutely terrifying and here it is. A Japanese babysitting agency banned all male babysitters after a string of pedophile cases. So apparently in Japan, there exists an organization called Kids Line. They provide babysitters and nannies for families in need. Now, according to what I could find online, Kids Line is actually a huge business with thousands of employees. And people in Japan use Kids Line every single day. But the concept of hiring a random person to come watch over your children is scary especially when you read about some of the stories that happened dealing with this organization. So in April 2019, a 29-year-old man was hired to watch over a young boy. Apparently, while the boy's parents were gone, he fondled the young boy's lower body. Less than a year later, he was re-arrested after he did the same thing to another child. Then on June 12, 2020, a 30-year-old male babysitter registered with the agency assaulted a young girl. The police said that this man touched the young girl's lower body and the charge that they charged him with is carnal abuse against a minor. And this is only a few of the incidents reported. After this, though, the agency said it's suspending all male babysitters from their service, which at the time was about 4,500 registered employees. And those babysitters who lost their work were mad. And so were parents. Because, you see, all of these cases had been kind of swept under the rug. No parents in Japan that used Kids Line frequently were being made aware of these pedophile events that were happening and they continued to allow random strangers directly into their homes with direct access to their children. According to officials in Japan, 5% of the male population have pedophile desires. And that's incredibly disturbing and a staggeringly high number. And I can't think of an easier way for a pedophile to gain access to a potential victim than through a service like this. I don't know, what do you guys think? Was this a drastic step banning all male babysitters or was this a good move? Imagine getting married only to be pushed off a cliff eight days later by your new wife. Jordan Graham met Cody Johnson eerily on Halloween 2011. The pair got engaged quite quickly in December 2012. Interestingly, they hired a professional songwriter for the wedding. Hearing the lyrics back now is incredibly disturbing. Everyone wants a safe place to fall and you're mine. You helped me climb higher for a better view and you're my safe place to fall. The pair married in June 2013. Guests noted that Jordan did seem a little off at the wedding. She seemed to be crying a bit too much when she was walking down the aisle. Close friends also claimed that she sent them text messages the day after saying that she totally had a meltdown. Seven days later, Cody disappeared. His boss reported him missing when he didn't turn up for work. Police found it quite odd that his wife hadn't reported him missing. She explained that she just didn't know where he was and the last she knew he'd gone out with friends. On July the 10th, she received an email about Cody. The email stated, My name is Tony. There is no bother looking for Cody anymore. He is gone. I saw your post on Twitter and I thought I'd email you. He had come with some buddies and met up with me on Sunday night in Columbia Falls. He was saying he needed to be with his buddies for a bit and take them for a joyride. 
Three of the guys came back saying that they had gone for a ride in the woods somewhere and Cody got out of the car and went for a little hike and they are positive he fell and he's dead Jordan. I don't know who the guys were, but they took off. So call off the missing persons report. Cody is gone for sure, Tony. During the search the next day in a national park, Jordan seemed uninterested and very disengaged. Now, strangely, she stopped at a secluded bit of road and told police she just had a bad feeling about that area. Despite how dangerous the area was, she climbed over rocks and peered over the edge of the cliff. Miraculously, she'd found a body. Tragically, this was the body of Cody. Now, police were able to track that suspicious email from Tony to a computer at Jordan's parents' house. Finally, she admitted to pushing her husband off the cliff. She eventually accepted a plea deal for second degree murder. She was given 30 years in prison. This 18 year old killed a mother and her daughter while street racing. So this is Cameron Heron. You probably know his story by now. In 2018, he was just a normal 18 year old kid. At the time of the accident, Cameron was producing content for YouTube, was going to school. And on the day of the crash, he decided that he and his brother Tristan were gonna race. So Cameron had a lifelong love of cars and so he and his brother would always race and he and his friends would race. But on that day, he reached a speed of 162 miles an hour in his car. And that's when he careened into Jessica and Lilia, a mother and daughter who were crossing the street. Jessica was actually wheeling her daughter across the street when Cameron struck them both with his vehicle. So tragically on that day, David, Jessica's husband and Lilia's father was driving home from work when he passed by a huge accident. He said to himself, wow, that must have been a bad accident. He went home, but when he got home, he noticed that his wife and daughter weren't there. So he got back in his vehicle, went out searching for them, and when he returned and passed by the scene of that accident, he noticed the stroller that was sitting on the side of the road. He recognized that that stroller belonged to his family. They owned one just like that. And shortly afterwards, he discovered that the victims of that horrific crash were his own wife and daughter, who were now dead. So Cameron was obviously arrested. He was eventually sentenced to 24 years in prison. And shockingly, afterwards, people have made thirst accounts dedicated to Cameron. The actual hashtag Cameron Heron on TikTok itself has billions of views, billions of views. And people have been idolizing this guy. His own parents have said in news articles that they get calls at all times of the day to their home from people from countries all over the world, specifically a lot of people from the Middle East, calling to see how their son is doing. But yeah, this is just a tragic story all around. David lost his wife and daughter, his entire family, due to one idiot's reckless decision to go 162 miles an hour down a normal road. And in prison, Cameron Heron is going to be there for a very long time. So his entire adult life is pretty much gone, vanished before he could even be, you know, the legal age to drink an alcoholic drink. This man's real life crimes inspired the Scream horror films. Daniel Rowling started a murderous rampage in Florida on Friday, August the 24th, 1990. He broke into a college student's apartment in the middle of the night. Two students were inside, Christina Powell and Sonja Larson. Terrifyingly, he crept into the lounge and watched Christina as she slept on the sofa. He then crept into Sonja's room, woke her and taped her mouth. After stabbing her to death, he went back to Christina, woke her, SA'd her and killed her too. He left their bodies posed for police to discover before showering and leaving. The following evening, he broke into the home of Christina Hoyt. However, she was actually not home, so horrifyingly, he stayed in her apartment until she returned. Upon her return, he pounced on her, taping her up and stabbing her to death. Before leaving, he actually cut her head off. After news spread, the locals were terrified, but this was far from over. Two days later, he struck again. He entered a house where he murdered Manny Taboda. Tracy Pauls was his roommate, and when she heard the attack, she ran in. She was also attacked before fleeing to her bedroom, but unfortunately, she was killed too. Daniel then decided to take a few months off, but little did everybody know that these were not his first victims. Roughly six months earlier, in November 1989, he murdered a family of three in Louisiana. Investigators noticed similarities between the murder sprees. They were also able to connect them through the killer's blood left at the scene. However, they still didn't know this man's identity. This is when Daniel made a mistake. He made friends with a Christian couple at church. He eventually confessed to them that he likes to stick knives in people. The couple called Crime Stoppers, and luckily Daniel was easy enough to find as he was already in prison for a robbery. He was found guilty and sentenced to death, and in 2006 he was executed. 
This Netflix star is a hardcore convicted pedophile, and this story is truly disturbing. So meet Jerry Harris. He was a star on the Netflix show Cheer. He's a famous cheerleader. And back when this show came out in 2020, he was all over. He was on the Ellen DeGeneres show. He was on various cheerleading programs. And yeah, he was one of the stars of the show Cheer. So the show Cheer actually followed a cheerleading team from Texas. And the show focused on the behind the scenes of cheerleading competitions. You know, what goes into it. All of the interactions between cheerleaders and the coaches. So when everybody first saw Jerry Harris on the show Cheer, they loved him. He was super over the top. He was always making people laugh. And Ellen DeGeneres even named him as her future Oscars correspondent. But then came the allegations in 2020. So a few months after the show debuted on Netflix, the FBI announced that they had a warrant for Jerry Harris's arrest. He had allegedly been seeking out relationships with minors, if you know what I'm talking about. Apparently, this entire thing was started by two twin brothers who were 13 years old when Jerry Harris was 19. And Jerry had been using Snapchat to try contact these young 13-year-old twin brothers and was asking for photos, videos, and to meet up. And once the FBI made this announcement, all sorts of messages started popping up that Jerry had sent minors on the internet, and they were really, really disturbing. And apparently Jerry's behavior wasn't only exclusive to the internet. He had actually met with minors in person and had contact with them, multiple minors. And I mean, you could actually look up these screenshots on the internet and they are really disturbing what he was saying to literal children. So in September of 2020, Jerry Harris was arrested in Chicago and charged with the production of CP. And eventually he would face an additional seven other charges. Now he apparently had the two male victims that he targeted at the beginning and then four other victims came forward. And they claimed that, yeah, he had done stuff in person with them. He had solicited things online. This Jerry guy was a true creep. And just last year, in 2022, Jerry Harris finally pled guilty to these charges, admitting that he had done this, and he was sentenced to 12 years in prison. And hopefully, because that sentence is not too long, he will learn something while he's in there. Otherwise, in about a decade, he'll be out on the streets again. These American missionaries serving in Haiti were just shot and killed and then set on fire by a local gang. And unfortunately, they were on the phone with their families who heard the entire thing. This is Davy Lloyd and his wife, Natalie, who just so happens to be the daughter of Missouri State Representative Ben Baker. The couple worked for Missions in Haiti, which is a missionary organization created by Davy's parents. Davy grew up in Haiti and loved the community there. He left when he was 18 to attend a Bible college and met Natalie, and the two got married in the summer of 2022 before returning back to Haiti to serve the children there. But last Thursday at around 9 p.m., the couple as well as a group of children were leaving a youth group activity at the church when they were ambushed by three trucks full of men from a local gang. The gang tied Davy up in his house and beat him up. After they beat him up, they robbed the organization of literally everything they had, including their vehicles, and left. Some neighbors were able to get inside the house to untie Davy, who then called his mom. Davy was crying on the phone scared for his life, and he told his mom that he and their compound were under attack. But just when things seemed like they were turning around, a second gang showed up and forced Davy, his wife, and the mission's local director, Jude Montes, into Davy's house and held them captive there for hours. During that time, the couple used a satellite internet link to make calls to their loved ones. They detailed every horrific thing that was happening to them, and all their loved ones could do was listen helplessly. This all took place in a community that is heavily controlled by gangs. Because of the heavy gang presence, police don't go in that area, so they were unable to get the missionaries out of the house. The head of the organization, which is Davy's parents, tried negotiating with the gang on the phone to release them in exchange for money, but it was of no use. The gang then fatally shot all three people before setting the house on fire and leaving. And unfortunately, there's reportedly a video circulating online of the crime scene that shows their bodies inside the house. According to Natalie's dad, Representative Ben Baker, the missions in Haiti previously managed to make friends with some of the gang members, who thought they were there for the right reasons. Davy and Natalie's bodies have since been taken to the U.S. Embassy, but at this point, no one knows how the investigation will proceed since the area is so controlled by gangs, and the fact that police won't go in that community because of it. They also don't know 100% at this point which gang is responsible for the murders. According to the missionary organization, the couple loved living in Haiti and doing humanitarian work that focused on the children there. Even as the violence worsened there over the last few months, they reportedly refused to leave the children behind who would have nowhere to go. They were also known to use their joint Instagram account called Adventures in Haiti to document their life and work there. So long, this side of my face, or my other side of the face, that he drug me, bit off my heel, and he drug me down a hill 30 feet. 
The story of the St. James Davis chimpanzee attack is one of the wildest things I've ever read. So this man, St. James Davis, and his wife LaDonna adopted a chimpanzee in the year 1967. Local poachers had murdered the chimpanzee's mother when he was only one day old, so he was an orphan. Now, St. James and LaDonna cared for this chimp his whole life, and they took him back to live with them in California. He even participated in the couple's eventual wedding. Eventually, though, Mo, the chimpanzee, bit someone who was visiting the couple's house, and the authorities then told them they had to relocate Mo to an animal sanctuary. So St. James and LaDonna agreed, and they would go regularly to visit Mo at the sanctuary. However, one day it was Mo's birthday, so they brought him some cake. They also brought toys, candy hearts, chocolate milk, and a raspberry sheet cake. Mo came over and was eating the cake with them and was happy to see them. But suddenly, two other chimpanzees broke free from their cage and rushed after the couple. One of the chimpanzees managed to bite LaDonna's thumb off. But St. James shoved his wife under the table, and the two chimpanzees then attacked him. They attacked him simultaneously, with one attacking St. James's face and the other attacking his foot. The sanctuary owner's son-in-law actually retrieved a weapon from his vehicle and shot one of the chimpanzees in the head to try stop the attack, but the other chimpanzee had already dragged St. James's body down a walkway. After all was said and done, this was an extremely gruesome and graphic scene. I'm going to read this to you. The chimpanzees had destroyed a majority of St. James's fingers, his left foot, most of his buttocks, both testicles, part of his torso, and parts of his face, including his nose and lips. A paramedic who arrived said, it looks like a grizzly bear attack. So St. James would spend six months in the hospital, but he recovered. And both of the chimpanzees who participated in the attack were shot and killed that day. But sadly, Mo, the couple's pet chimpanzee they had come to see in the first place, he was scared during the attack. He tried to help, but he couldn't do anything. And eventually he was sent to live on a ranch for performing animals. But Mo, the chimpanzee, disappeared in 2008. Construction workers who were working on a project nearby on the day of his escape said that they saw Mo running by a home nearby. And when they found out about this, St. James and LaDonna spent a ton of money even hiring helicopters to do flyovers to try find their beloved chimpanzee best friend. They even had authorities search the San Bernardino National Forest. But Mo never returned and he was never found. That means that somewhere out there, Mo might still be hiding. Actually, I don't know how long chimpanzees live, but... It is interesting that Mo vanished into thin air after all of this and was never found. If you want to listen to more true crime stories, listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms. This man convinced his... However, according to the phrase, you can't make this stuff up. I have known the story of real-life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic child, murderer, and cannibal daughter to kill his wife so he could marry his teenage sister-in-law. In 1985, the Brown family were living in Orange County. David Brown and his wife Linda had a young daughter called Crystal. David had a 14-year-old daughter from a previous marriage called Cinnamon. She lived with them along with Linda's younger sister, Patty. Now, she was 17 and had moved in with the Browns when she was just 11. David seemed very keen to turn Cinnamon and Patty against his wife, Linda. He made claims that Linda was plotting to murder him and take over his business. This was untrue, but he convinced the pair that they needed to murder her in order to save him. He kept saying to Cinnamon, if you loved me, you would do this for me. He convinced her that because of her age, she wouldn't go to prison for very long at all. He also said that if she faked unaliving herself, then the police would feel sorry for her. Little did Cinnamon know that David's real motive for wanting his wife killed was so that he could marry her teenage sister. The girl in question was Patty, and when she moved in age 11, she had been repeatedly SA'd by David. Because of her age, she just thought that this was normal. After brainwashing the girls to go along with his murderous plan, he took out some life insurance policies for his wife. In the dead of night on the 19th of March, 1985, David woke the two women up. He handed Cinnamon a gun. He actually left the house and went to the store to make sure that he had an alibi. During this time, Cinnamon went into her stepmom's room as she slept and fired two shots into her abdomen. When police arrived later that day, they found Cinnamon covered in her own vomit. She had a note that said, Dear God, please forgive me. I didn't mean to hurt her. She'd taken an overdose and would have died if she hadn't been sick. Now, Cinnamon was sentenced to 27 years to life, which came as a huge shock considering what David had told her. Meanwhile, David and Patty secretly married in 1986 and had a daughter. Now, whilst in prison, Cinnamon was actually coming to terms with how she'd been manipulated. 
she started actually working alongside the investigators. She began secretly wearing a wire during her visits with David. He soon incriminated himself and even promised to persuade Patty to admit to the murder. Eventually, David was arrested and Patty discovered what he'd been saying. She went on to testify against him. But things don't stop there. Shockingly, David even then tried to organize Patty's murder. He offered a man half a million dollars to do this and he thought in doing so, it would delay his trial. The man actually just told police about this plan and David was sentenced to life in prison and died in 2014. Cinnamon served seven years in prison and then completely turned her life around. Hamara coined the phrase, you can't make this stuff up, like I've known the story of real life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with grey hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic, child, murderer and cannibal. This teenage boy was brutally dismembered and tortured, and this is a massive trigger warning. This case takes place in Ireland on January 12th, 2020. Draghada is a port town in Ireland and Keane Woods was born there on February 2nd, 2003. Growing up, his favorite thing to do was drive his dirt bike around, but in his early teenage years, he started involving himself in petty crimes. And in 2018, he turned to organized crime when he was just 15 and got the reputation as a very violent individual. January 12th, 2020 started out as a normal day for the Woods family, but by the time the afternoon came around, everything had changed. Keen was missing and nobody could get a hold of him. The following day, his sister posted on Facebook asking if anyone knew where her brother was. The last time Keen was seen was on Sunday afternoon near his home. That day, Keen called his mother for some money so he can get a taxi home. And since then, his family and friends couldn't get a hold of him. His family then reported him missing to the police. When the police took a deeper look at Keen's history, they realized his family had a good reason to worry. Just days before Keen disappeared, a video was posted online by a local criminal, and in this video, the man made numerous threats to kill 17-year-old Keen. The threats were graphic and involved words like abduction, murder, and dismemberment. At the time, Drakeda was in the midst of a gang feud, and by the time Keen reached his teenage years, it escalated to full war and Keen was a part of the gangs. He became involved in one of the dealing gangs, right after the same time when the rivalry with a competing gang started to heat up. Keen's group carried weapons and they weren't afraid to use them. They also enjoyed making bombs which they used to attack their opponent's hideouts. And Keen did a bunch of awful things. This one time, he threw a petrol bomb inside the home of a boy who owed the gang money, and Keen told them he would burn them alive in their beds and claimed he didn't do it right the first time. Not long after this, he was arrested and charged with the possession of illegal substances. There's also reports that Keen tortured and killed a woman's cat, since the woman owed him money and she couldn't pay it back on time. These are the things that gave him the reputation of being a dangerous, violent young man. On the Monday, just a couple hours after Keen's sister posted asking for help to find him, a man walking down the street in East Dublin came across a bulky bag. And when he opened the bag, he was met with a horrifying sight. Inside were multiple dismembered human limbs and flip-flops. The following morning at 1.30 a.m., officers responded to reports of a burning vehicle. And when they put out the fire, they found a human head and two hands entangled in the burnt wreck. DNA tests then proved that the heads, hands, and limbs all belonged to Keen. The flip-flops did not belong to him, but in the wake of his murder, they were interpreted as a threat to the gang he used to run with. It turns out, weeks before Keen's murder, a 35-year-old man from the opposing gang was attacked on the street and was wearing a pair of flip-flops that were stolen during the attack. Someone from Keen's gang then posed for a photo with the flip-flops and posted the photo online with a caption mocking the guy they belonged to. The man who owned these flip-flops was Robbie Lauer. Now, the murder and dismemberment of a teenager might seem dramatic for the loss of just some flip-flops, but for those who knew Robbie Lauer's reputation, it was exactly his style. Robbie was a hitman and was a member of the gang known as the anti maguire faction. He became the prime suspect in the murder of Keen. He was also the prime suspect in a number of other killings. But despite his violent record, he was released from prison just one month before Keen's murder. Robbie was then tied to Keen's death when one of his associates pointed authorities in the direction of the house where the teenager had been murdered. Gerald McKenna was the owner of the home and he told the police Robbie threatened to kill him and his children and turn them into minced meat if he didn't clean up the crime scene inside his home. 
But when he arrived home after the killing of Keen, there was so much blood that he couldn't clean up all the evidence. Keen's family was devastated by his death and the way his body had been so gruesomely dismembered and spread out. All they had was his head, hands, and limbs. There was hopes the rest of him would be found so they can lay him to rest intact, and three months later in April 2020, the final pieces of Keen's body was found in his hometown. And in the months it was out there, it had been eaten quite a bit by animals. Keen was suspected of playing both sides of the gangs, and this is why he was targeted for murder. News then came out on how Keen died when two men were arrested. Rival gang members Paul Crosby, aged 27, and Gerald Cruz, aged 49. It turned out the day Keen had gone missing, Paul Crosby had met with him. Keen trusted Paul due to him playing both sides of the gangs. They met outside a shop in town and Keen got into the car with him and Gerald, before being driven to the house where he would be murdered. Keen was tortured with power tools by the killer and stabbed multiple times in the torso. It's believed the gruesome murder and torture was filmed intended to be used as an intimidation to the rival gang. And it's believed the footage is out there somewhere, but I couldn't find it and it hasn't been confirmed by the police. Keen's body was then dismembered with the power tools. There was no evidence that Paul Crosby and Gerald Cruz were present at the time of the murder, but they were the ones who lured him to his death. Robbie Lauer was never arrested or charged. The opportunity for justice was missed when Robbie was killed in a gang shooting not long after Keen's torso was discovered. Paul Crosby and Gerald Cruz were charged in relation to the murder of Keen. Paul was sentenced to 10 years and Gerald was sentenced to 7 years. Also, Gerald McKenna, the man who owned the house Keen was killed in, received 4 years since he attempted to get rid of evidence. Did this woman chop her husband up and dump him in a suitcase? Melanie Maguire married Bill in 1999. They had two sons together and from the outside it looked like they had a really good relationship. However, behind closed doors things were not good. Melanie claimed that Bill had a gambling problem and a temper. One night in 2004, Melanie claims that Bill pushed her against a wall in an argument and hit her. She then stated that he tried to choke her. The next day, Bill was missing. Melanie contacted a divorce attorney and also filed for a restraining order. On May the 5th, 2004, some fishermen discovered a suitcase in Chesapeake Bay. Inside, they made a horrific discovery. Inside was a man's dismembered legs. Over the next week or two, more suitcases were found. These contained a torso, a head, thighs, and a pelvis. It was found that the person had been shot to death. When the man was identified as Bill Maguire, Melanie said that she burst into tears. Interestingly, police found that Melanie had bought a gun two days before Bill's disappearance. They also found out she was having an affair. Police then discovered Bill's vehicle in Atlantic City. Melanie claims that she'd moved the vehicle as a prank. She said that he was out at a casino and she was sick of him gambling, so she moved the car. However, police found on Melanie's computer that she googled how to purchase guns illegally. She also searched how to commit murder and undetectable poisons. Rubbish bags in her house also matched the rubbish bags that Bill was wrapped in. Melanie was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, but she maintained she was not the killer. She suggested that her husband may have been killed over gambling debts. She claims that Bill had told her to buy a gun to protect herself. I bet you didn't know the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is based off true events. I am Bubba Sawyer, but you may know me as Leatherface. I was born into a deranged family of cannibals and sadistic killers living in a remote Texas farmhouse. My mother was a quiet woman, but my father was a monster. He was an abusive alcoholic who would beat my mother and us kids whenever he got the chance. As a child, I was always fascinated with the animals that my father would bring home to slaughter. I would watch as he killed them and I felt a strange sense of satisfaction. I didn't realize it at the time, but that was the beginning of my descent into madness. One day, my father brought home a chainsaw. It was a massive tool, and I was in awe of it. I begged my father to let me use it, and he eventually gave in. From that moment on, I was hooked. I would spend hours on end, cutting through trees, and anything else that I could find. The sound of the chainsaw was like music to my ears. It was my escape from the reality of my life. But it wasn't until my father died that I truly lost my mind. I inherited his house, and I turned it into my own personal slaughterhouse. 
I would lure people in and kill them using my trusty chainsaw to do the deed. The screams of my victims were like a symphony to me. One day, a man named Kirk entered my home to barter for gas. I attacked him with a hammer killing him. A woman named Pam came in after him. She found my living room strewn with human and animal bones. I grabbed her, impaled her on a meat hook and dismembered Kirk's body with my chainsaw as Pam watched. Jerry came looking for them both. He found Pam's nearly dead, spasming body in a chest freezer. I killed him with a hammer. Later that night, I ambushed their two surviving friends, Sally and Franklin. I killed Franklin with my chainsaw. I captured Sally and brought her back to the house. We tried to include Grandpa in murdering her with a hammer, but Grandpa's grip was weak and he kept dropping the hammer repeatedly. Sally broke free and ran onto our road in front of our house, pursued by my family. The truck driver attacks me with a large wrench, injuring me, and escaped on foot. Sally, covered in blood, flags down a passing pickup truck and climbs into the bed, narrowly escaping me. I was so angry I let her get away. My family won't be happy about this. You will not believe this insane plot twist. In 2008, Carolyn Watson and Julian Butchwald were a young religious couple. They were living in Melbourne, Australia and had been together around two years. Julian was driving the pair to a picnic date in the car, but he actually stopped the car suddenly, noticing an animal on the side of the road. Suddenly, something horrific happened. Carolyn's vision went completely black after being blindfolded by a terrifying masked man. All she could work out was she was being stripped off and thrown into a vehicle. The car finally stopped and she took her blindfold off and she was really relieved to see that her boyfriend was by her side. He'd also been stripped off and the couple were completely in the middle of nowhere. The pair managed to untie themselves, but were having to just wander around aimlessly for a week, trying to find safety. Meanwhile, police were desperately searching for the couple. Family and friends were really concerned and they knew how out of character this was for the pair to go missing. They sent out air and water search teams, but just couldn't locate the couple. As the missing pair were very religious, they'd actually vowed to be celibate until marriage, but Julian started to suggest that it might be a good idea to break this celibacy in order to keep them warm. Finally, a local farmer found the couple and alerted police. However, they quickly found that the story didn't really add up. Julian soon confessed to police that he'd actually made the whole thing up and he'd staged the kidnapping. His motive was purely to try and get his girlfriend to break their vow of celibacy. This guy is one of the most awful serial killers there has ever been, and I feel like he's never talked about. In my opinion, this guy's worse than Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer. Hi Meg, I talk about your crime. Let's get into the story of The Butcher, the worst serial killer Canada has ever seen. Robert Picton was born October 24th, 1949, in British Columbia, Canada. Robert had quite a bad upbringing. His dad was very abusive. He actually grew up on a pig farm. From a really young age, him and his brother had to work countless hours on this pig farm. And then they were forced to go straight to school without taking a shower or anything. Because he was showing up to school unwashed, Robert started getting bullied and they gave him the nickname Stinky Piggy. As Robert grew older, he was said to be very quiet, but he apparently sometimes had these weird bursts of bizarre behavior. These bursts would come out of nowhere and he would just start acting really strange. In 1996, Robert's brother opened up a kind of charity thing. The charity was started to try to make more money for their pig farm. It was called the Piggy Palace Good Times Society. And what they would do is they would hold huge parties and raves to try and raise money. And I'm not joking when I say huge parties and raves. 17,000 people were said to have shown up at one point. 17,000 people at once. Sex workers and biker gangs would join these parties as well, but for Robert, it all started going downhill in 1997 when he attempted to murder a girl. I don't usually do this in these videos, but a lot of you ask what blush I use, and this is the blush I use. It's usually 10 pounds on the TikTok shop, but it's on for fiver right now. So if you click right here, you can get it. I just ordered kind of a peachy version of this. I'm not being paid to talk about this, I just saw they were on offer and you guys ask about these all the time, so get your hands on them for cheap while you can. So Robert attempts to murder a woman for the first time that we know of. According to her statement, he attempted to handcuff her 
and then he started stabbing her multiple times before she managed to get away. This should have been the thing that got him on police radar, but he was able to get the charges dropped because the woman he attacked was on a lot of drugs at the time and Robert used that to come up with a story. He told police like she was hitchhiking, I was just trying to help her and she attacked me and they believed him because she was on drugs. And unfortunately for the next 60 women he would kill, he was let go and he was able to come up with a strategy that wouldn't get him caught next time. He developed a plan and started killing a bunch of women. And Robert was really, really good at staying under the radar. Now, what did he do exactly? Let me tell you, because it's just, it's disturbing. First of all, he always went for hitchhikers, addicts, or prostitutes. And what he would do is he would promise them money, drugs, accommodation, anything to get them back to his farm. Once he got them back, he would then shoot or strangle them to death. And this next part is why he was given the name the Butcher. He would take the victims' bodies, chop them up, and feed them to his pigs. Now, if you're not aware of this already, pigs will literally eat anything. Everything. So the evidence was just, bye. They were getting rid of the evidence for him. All of a sudden, there is an increase in missing women in the area. But sadly, because he only went after sex workers or addicts or hitchhikers, no one cared. And this always makes me so mad with cases like these. Like, they're still human beings, but no bodies were showing up, so there was no crime, no body, no crime. But as the numbers started rising, people were kind of getting a bit worried. A group of people that weren't the police actually got a list together of all of the names of these young women who were missing. They brought that to the police and were like, do you see now? And that's when the investigation actually began into finding out what happened to these girls. And all of these girls had one person in common, Robert Picton. He was the only person whose name continuously came up when they were looking for these girls. Police needed a way to get onto the farm with a warrant without him knowing about it and hiding all the evidence first. And so they heard that he had possession of an illegal firearm. And so they used that as the cover up to get onto his property. On the property, they found multiple items that belonged to these missing women along with some blood-stained clothing and tiny bone fragments. Now, things aren't looking too good for Robert, but because the pigs had eaten all the evidence, basically all of it, they were only able to charge him with the murder of six women. And so he got six counts of murder. When he got arrested, he actually said that he killed 49 women and that he was sad that he didn't get to round up to 50. What the hell, Robert? What does he want the police officer to say like, oh, I feel so bad for you. No. He was arrested in 2002 and this trial was huge. Of course, he was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. But guys, that's not the worst part of this story because I'm getting to that now. One element of the story that I kept out until now is that Robert, <laughs> Robert sold the meat of his pigs people who lived around the area. These pigs who ate the remains of 60 women were sold to his neighbors. When I say neighbors, I just mean people who live in the area. So like secondhand, cam can secondhand cannibalism. I could never eat pig again if that was me. So yeah, they were pretty um, disturbed and freaked out by this information, which is uh, totally understandable and just totally disgusting. After a huge search of his property, police now believe that the number of women Robert killed was in the 60s. 60 women. 60 mother, daughters, wives. It's insane. It really annoys me with cases like these. I know it was like in 2002 and things have changed, but have they? I find that a lot of cases like these that I cover always start with, oh, all these women were going missing, but they were sex workers, but they were drug addicts, who cares? And it's like, 
it's insane to me that like they're not seen as equals to any other woman walking on the street but whatever hopefully that changes and for those wondering i have actually covered this story before but the quality of the video was so so bad that i just i couldn't keep it up anymore like it really bothered me to watch back so i thought i would remake it in a higher quality way i hope you guys enjoyed it regardless and have a wonderful day my heart goes out to every single one of the victims their families and people who cared about them um and i hope robert rots in jail anyways this is not a good representation of canadians we're actually really nice people i'll see you all in the next video love you guys bye you will not believe this insane plot twist. In 2008, Carolyn Watson and Julian Butchwald were a young religious couple. They were living in Melbourne, Australia and had been together around two years. Julian was driving the pair to a picnic date in the car, but he actually stopped the car suddenly, noticing an animal on the side of the road. Suddenly, something horrific happened. Carolyn's vision went completely black after being blindfolded by a terrifying masked man. All she could work out was she was being stripped off and thrown into a vehicle. The car finally stopped and she took her blindfold off and she was really relieved to see that her boyfriend was by her side. He'd also been stripped off and the couple were completely in the middle of nowhere. The pair managed to untie themselves, but were having to just wander around aimlessly for a week, trying to find safety. Meanwhile, police were desperately searching for the couple. Family and friends were really concerned and they knew how out of character this was for the pair to go missing. They sent out air and water search teams, but just couldn't locate the couple. As the missing pair were very religious, they'd actually vowed to be celibate until marriage, but Julian started to suggest that it might be a good idea to break this celibacy in order to keep them warm. Finally, a local farmer found the couple and alerted police. However, they quickly found that the story didn't really add up. Julian soon confessed to police that he'd actually made the whole thing up and he'd staged the kidnapping. His motive was purely to try and get his girlfriend to break their vow of celibacy. This island has one of the most disturbing histories in America, and no one really knows the full truth behind it. So like I said before, this island was owned by multi-millionaire Francis Sheldon, pictured right here. And Francis and a number of other local men from Michigan, including this guy, Gerald S. Richards, ran a boys camp on the island. They would fly kids to the island on this airstrip, kids from the YMCA and other schools and communities in the area. And both the children and the parents of the children who attended this boys camp were told that this was an island of fun where kids could relax. They had big brothers there. It was going to be totally safe. And this camp ran on this island for a period of years. Then one day, some of the kids who attended the camp began to tell their parents that the counselors or the teachers, the adults that were there on the island, had behaved with them in very, very inappropriate ways. They began telling their friends and parents that they were taken into these cabins pictured here on the island. They were assaulted. They were told to remove all of their clothing and that there were cameras all over the place. Well, it turns out that this guy, the multimillionaire with political and business connections in the area, Francis Sheldon, was running a massive CP ring. And they had been abusing the children on this island under the guise of bringing them to a boys camp for years, recording all of it, selling it across the world. And some of the more affluent clients of their business were even allowed to take trips to the island themselves to see some of these young boys. Now, this story bears an obvious resemblance to the story of Jeffrey Epstein, but there are some very, very strange things that are happening here that nobody knows about and the government still refuses to talk about to this day. So let's talk about this guy, Gerald S. Richards. He was a gym teacher at a local Catholic school who went down for the crimes and he was heavily involved with every aspect of this business, if you know what I mean. Well, it seems like through his political and business connections, Francis Sheldon was actually tipped off that he was about to be arrested and raided and charged with these horrific crimes. So Francis, before he could be brought to justice for these crimes, he actually fled the country in a personal plane. He then moved to France, got remarried, and died in Amsterdam, and never had to pay for any of the crimes that were committed here. But it's when we start talking about the murders that this story really starts to blow my mind. So take a good look at this guy, Chris Bush. This is Christopher Bush's father, Harold Lee Bush. Now, he was an executive with General Motors, and the family was obviously extremely wealthy. They were politically connected, and they were very connected to every business in the area. These guys had a lot of power. But back to Christopher Bush. This guy had assaulted a number of children. He'd been let out of prison, let out of jail in a very, very suspicious way, multiple times, put on bail for serious offenses. 
And he was a alleged associate of the crime ring that was happening on North Fox Island. Meaning that, like I said earlier, he was one of those people who could afford to actually fly out to the island to do things himself. I'm out of time. Follow for part three. This is where it gets juicy. Mysterious case absolutely does not sit right with me. Someone knows something and has not come forward. On the 12th of July 2015, 18-year-old Tiffany and her parents attended a graduation party in New Jersey. At around 9pm, one of Tiffany's friends spoke to her parents and claimed that they were really annoyed because Tiffany had used their debit card without permission. Tiffany initially denied this to her friend, but then did admit this to her mum Diane a little bit later. At this point, they were all outside Tiffany's house and Diane went inside to find her husband. When she returned outside of the house, Tiffany had vanished. Now they were able to see Tiffany on the deer cameras that they had outside the house. She appears to be walking down the driveway in her normal clothing and white headband. When they tried to find Tiffany, they actually made a terrifying discovery. Her phone was lying on the floor at the bottom of the driveway. Immediately they knew something was wrong as Tiffany never had her phone out of her sight. At 11.30 p.m. her family called the police. Little did they know 27 minutes earlier Tiffany had been hit by a train. Frustratingly, pretty much straight away, police presumed this death to be a self-unaliving. However, that just didn't seem to fit with the evidence presented. All of Tiffany's family and friends said how much of an upbeat person she was and that she was really happy at the time. She was making plans for the future and the autopsy also showed that she had a clean toxicology report. Now in the deer cam footage, she was fully clothed, but when she was found, she was just in her underwear with no shoes on. Upsettingly, two weeks after her death, Tiffany's mum actually found her missing trainers and headband more than a mile away from the track. Could someone have murdered Tiffany and then dumped her body on the train tracks to make it look like she did this herself? Tiffany's parents certainly think so. They definitely suspect some foul play was involved. The story of this American female serial killer will make your hair stand up. As if her crimes are not horrific enough, she earned the nickname the Giggling Granny. How creepy is that? Nanny Doss was raised on a farm by a very controlling father, and one of the few joys that she had in life was sneaking into her mother's room and reading her romance novels, and she would daydream about the day that she'd be swept off her feet and have her happily ever after. And she got married to her first husband at the age of 16, and it was a miserable marriage. The couple had four daughters together, two of which mysteriously died of food poisoning, at which point the husband took one remaining daughter and fled because he was scared to death of Nanny. The remaining infant baby named Florine was left with Nanny, and Nanny picked up and married somebody new. Now, this man was an alcoholic, but despite that, they were married 16 years and raised Florine together. This is where the bloodbath really begins. Nanny was in the room right after her daughter Melvina had given birth to her second grandchild. And while Melvina was still loopy from the labor drugs and she was exhausted, she could have sworn that she saw Nanny stick a hat pin in the baby's head. Melvina kind of passed out and went back to sleep, but when she came to, she started asking her family members, did Nanny have a hat pin and stick the baby in the head? And the family regretted to inform Melvina that the baby had in fact died. And yes, they did see Nanny holding a hat pin. However, the doctors couldn't give a positive explanation for the baby's death. The death of the baby absolutely shattered Melvina and her husband and they started fighting and drifting apart and Melvina started dating a soldier named Robert who Nanny did not approve of. And one night when Melvina was out of the house and Robert was left alone with Nanny, Robert mysteriously died and Nanny received $500 in life insurance that she had taken out on Robert a couple weeks earlier. Not long after that, Nanny's husband forced himself on her and she didn't like that so she put rat poison in his corn whiskey jar and he died that night. Nanny married her third husband only three days after meeting him, and he died shortly after this of heart failure. She picked up some life insurance, bought some land, and built a new house. Her late third husband left behind a mother and a bedridden sister who also died shortly after. At this point, Nanny burned the house down, took that life insurance money, and moved on. Then Nanny landed a fourth husband, and at this point, her mom moved in with him. She found out that her husband was cheating, so she poisoned him to death, and for good measure, she poisoned her mom to death, too. Then she married her a fifth man named Samuel Doss, who was very disapproving of the romance novels that she loved to read. He went to the hospital one night with flu-like symptoms and was diagnosed with a severe digestive tract infection. He was treated and sent home. And a few days later, he showed up dead. The doctors were very suspicious of this, so they did an autopsy and found enough arsenic in his system to kill 20 men. Nanny was arrested shortly after this and confessed to killing four of her husbands, her mother-in-law, her mother, her sister, her sister-in-law, and yes, sadly, even the baby with the hat pin. 
will not believe this insane plot twist. In 2008, Carolyn Watson and Julian Butchwald were a young religious couple. They were living in Melbourne, Australia and had been together around two years. Julian was driving the pair to a picnic date in the car, but he actually stopped the car suddenly, noticing an animal on the side of the road. Suddenly, something horrific happened. Carolyn's vision went completely black after being blindfolded by a terrifying masked man. All she could work out was she was being stripped off and thrown into a vehicle. The car finally stopped and she took her blindfold off and she was really relieved to see that her boyfriend was by her side. He'd also been stripped off and the couple were completely in the middle of nowhere. The pair managed to untie themselves, but were having to just wander around aimlessly for a week, trying to find safety. Meanwhile, police were desperately searching for the couple. Family and friends were really concerned and they knew how out of character this was for the pair to go missing. They sent out air and water search teams, but just couldn't locate the couple. As the missing pair were very religious, they'd actually vowed to be celibate until marriage, but Julian started to suggest that it might be a good idea to break this celibacy in order to keep them warm. Finally, a local farmer found the couple and alerted police. However, they quickly found that the story didn't really add up. Julian soon confessed to police that he'd actually made the whole thing up and he'd staged the kidnapping. His motive was purely to try and get his girlfriend to break their vow of celibacy.